Hi, I'm Chris Sarandon, and welcome to Cooking by Heart, where we revisit the vivid memories of the food we grew up with and uh, the people and the stories attached to that time in our lives. My guest today is Christopher Spinoza, one of the lead contestants in the new Gordon Ramsay Fox Network cooking show, Next Level Chef. Christopher began his career as a music major in college that came to love cooking during his winter and summer breaks, toiling in kitchens to make money. After working as a musician after college, he decided to attend culinary school, after which he bounced around for seven years working in restaurants such as Tom Colicchio's famous craft restaurant in Manhattan, as well as many other well-known restaurants in Manhattan and Brooklyn, and of course, New York City. He's currently a private chef in West Palm Beach, Florida, as we all await his fate on Gordon Ramsay's Next Level Chef. Christopher, welcome. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate you having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure, my my pleasure. Uh, before we get into the nitty gritty of what's going on in your life now, of course, the show uh, involves a great deal of about where we come from and uh, what was that like when we were growing up. So tell me, first of all, where you're from, where you grew up, what your provenance is. So I'm originally from Long Island, New York, the South Shore, specifically in Massapequa. Uh, it's a, you know, mostly suburban town, um, combination of middle class as well as some aristocrats as well. Um, I grew up in an Italian family, mainly. Uh, my mom is German and Irish, but my dad's predominantly Italian side was really, you know, the core of most of the memories, I would say, as far as the, whole the cultural goes. kind of uh, uh, over overlay to your life. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. My mom's side of the family was absolutely, you know, um, uh, let's say, you know, more reserved. Um, those family gatherings weren't exactly as uh, chaotic, let's say, as with the <laughs> Italian side of the I know those well. are the ones. Yeah. Yeah. Those are the ones I would come home from and I wouldn't have to go to bed immediately. The Italian ones, I was already out in the car by the time we left the house. <laughs> Exhausted. <laughs> it just shot. It All that shot. energy. I know, I know. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about what what it was like growing up at home. That is, I'm specifically interested about. Your, was your mom a good cook? Your dad? So, as far as the cooking goes, it was mainly my mom. Uh, she wasn't any sort of you know culinary savant or anything. She she cooked she cooked good food. You know, she kept the family well fed. Um, but to that end, like I wasn't the kind of chef that grew up with like these very vivid memories of, you know, sitting on the table next to my Nana or my mom while they rolled out pasta or something like that. It was very <laughs> yeah, much right. just, it was very like, like no one would have called it that I was going to become a chef way back, uh, you know, during that part of my life. That was very much a, you know, out of left field sort of decision. You know? What were your interests then? Do you remember what you were, what you grew up sort of being drawn to besides uh, uh, obviously music? Yes. Sure. Sure. I mean, I was definitely a big uh, video game kid. You know, I'd get up early before school, play video games. I, you know, started getting into when I got as I got older, I got into like track and field and cross country. Mm -hmm. My mom, my dad put me into like, you know, soccer, baseball, basketball and a whole bunch of sports when I was like a uh, toddler. But none of it for some reason stuck with me as I got older. I don't know what it was. I just I didn't have like a big, you know, pull towards it. Got it. Got it. So now let's go back. Uh, let's sure. revisit as we talk about here um, around the dinner table. Now, what were the what were the sort of standard meals like that your mom cooked? Uh, so it's kind of like a smorgasbord as far as like, um, you know, call it national, you know, nationalities and cuisines. Um, you know, some nights my mom would just do some very simple like chicken and rice and I wouldn't even give it any sort of like, you know, cultural character to it it was very much just a simple like here's the ingredients we have i got some chicken we have some rice and vegetables very simple right. and then some nights some nights we would have you know chicken parm we would do chicken marsala my mom would make pasta primavera you know despite her being german and irish of descent she was you know married to a full-blown italian husband so you know the most of the meals were influenced as such mm -hmm. So did did he cook at all? My dad, no. I mean, it, when my mom was uh, busy in the mornings and my dad had to take me to school for whatever reason, like, you know, he'd make me breakfast, but he wasn't, he was by no means, you know, a, uh, you know, a consistent cook. So where did your mom pick up the dishes that she made that were Italian? 
I would assume that they probably came from when she was, you know, dating my dad and she would go over to his place uh, and, you know, met like my nana and pop up. I would assume they kind of, that was kind of where it started. Um, and then maybe she like, you know, heard some recipes from friends, you know, word of mouth as far as, as far as I understood, you yeah, know, yeah. she wasn't the kind of person that I would see, you know, yank a cookbook off like a shelf at Barnes and Noble, you know, and start, uh, and start going to town on it. You know, mm -hmm. she was very much, and you know, like I said, she, she wasn't culinarily pulled into the food. It was, it was very much so like keep the family fed. But I think because, like I said, she was married to an Italian husband. I think it more it it, it pushed her at the very least more so than most, you know, home cooks mm -hmm. to at the time, especially right. to you know at least bring some sort of um, pizzazz to the table, if you will. Now, did your mom work? Yeah, so she was an accountant. Ah, so she had so she had a job. So so and, and I have this conversation with a lot of people whose mothers sure. worked, and that was that that. Right. Basically, cooking at home was their second job. Sure, sure. Absolutely. You know, never mind dealing with all the other things that most women have to deal with in the home, the laundry, the you know, making sure right. that kids got to places on time, et cetera. Exactly. So and was she so, so as a result, was she an enthusiastic cook or was this something that just kind of uh, she knew she had to do and she did it? I mean, obviously, there was love in it. For sure. I would say that I, if, if there's like, you know, between those two spectrums, like enthusiastic versus this is a task, she kind of like was right there in the middle. In I the would middle. Say. Yeah. You know, it was like I said, she wasn't uh, she wasn't like, you know, um, revamping recipes all the time. I mean, she would she would you she had like a pretty consistent Rolodex that she would go through. And mm -hmm. you know, as, a, as a kid, as as a kid, like any, I had the things that I did like and the things not so much. Talk about the things that you did like. Of course, absolutely. She uh, there was a chicken marsala dish that she made that was always just for some reason it always stuck out to me. Um, it was just like a simple bread chicken with a marsala sauce with mushrooms and you know fettuccine or linguine pasta. That was mm -hmm. it. It was very simple, but for some reason that in and of itself was always the thing that she knew I certainly liked. Well, there's a also there's a very distinct flavor to to right. anything marsala right. because right. of the Right. I'm, I'm assuming she cooked it with the wine. She did. Um, I never got a glimpse of like the bottle itself, so I couldn't tell you at the time. Right. She, actually got the she probably hid it from you. <laughs> she might have. She might yeah, have. And, right. and for all and for all I know, she she could have gotten the sweet marsala instead of the dry marsala, which you're supposed to use. But that wouldn't have mattered to me when I was a kid because I didn't know any better, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I just knew that anytime she made it, it was I was always excited about it. Um, yeah. Another dish that she was uh, that she would make. I mean, you can't go on with a homemade chicken parm. Mm -hmm. She always got like these. She always got nice, like pounded out chicken cutlets from an Italian butcher. She got the Italian seasoned breadcrumbs, and more importantly, she got a good quality, you know, mozzarella as well as like a tomato, a nice marinara to go with it. Mm -hmm. She got the bufala. She got the bufala yeah, mozzarella. She did. She she did. She did. And it was you know like any time that that she. Anytime that dish was finished and we were ready to eat it, like I'd always just murder it. Just gone. like just put it right down. Yeah, gone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Like, and like, especially when I started doing, you know, cross country in high school, like obviously you have to tank up on your calories for yeah. something like that. So it was like I went from eating one of those, you know, big guys to like two of them. And, you know, the next day I would uh, go to the meats and feel like Superman. <laughs> <laughs> the car the carb loading paid off. Oh, absolutely. You yeah, know, that's probably the most fun part about doing those sorts of sports, really, is that you get to just absolutely go to town on food yeah, yeah. and have zero shame because, you know, the next day, you know, the meter is still running. Right. right. <laughs> You're burning it <laughs> off. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, exactly. now, you mentioned your grandparents, the Italian grandparents, right? Yeah. Did you guys go to their house and have dinner sometime? Did they come over? Did they did? Did your grandmother or grandfather cook? So I'm the youngest of three brothers. And I think by the time I was, I had like the awareness, I say the awareness of like, you know, what was being cooked and what I liked and what have you. I think by the time I really had that awareness, we were going out to dinner a little bit more often. And then to that end, we'd always go over to my nan and pop up's house, but we would always bring food and cook there. Mm -hmm. But to that end, I know that my mom, and my dad 
A, my dad told me that my Nana and Papa cooked all the time when he was growing up. Like, you know, they're, they're two Italian. They're like, they're first generation Italian immigrants. So it's like, they, they were just freaking, yeah. they were going to town and cooking all the time. Mm-hmm. Just to like, the aggressive touch. When I got into culinary school, started becoming a chef. Um, you know, my Nana and Papa have since, have, have since passed. And apparently I found out after the fact that my Nana actually had a cookbook laying around that house somewhere. I had a few, quite a few recipes uh, wedged in it. So as I understand, they did cook a lot. Did you inherit the cookbook? It is somewhere in my parents' place back up in Long Island. I know that. Oh, you got to get it, so, man. I know. It's like now it's like my it's like my own. Um, it's like my own little like journey here. Like it's like, you know, uh, it's like my religious uh, pilgrimage that I got to make back up mm-hmm. to New York and get and get Nana's cookbook. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have one of the first Greek American cookbooks ever published. Uh, and it happened to be by a friend of my mom's who put it together with uh, someone else. And I still have that book and I still have literally written down. I, I've taken a lot of the recipes over the years and adapted them and have written in different proportions sure. in the, you know, in the book. Or I have um, uh, sheets of paper that my mother gave me with other recipes on them that I have in the cookbook. It's an indispensable part of uh, a legacy as we grow older. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, the one thing that I've noticed is like, obviously food has transformed over the years, but I, I would like to, you know, especially being like the chef in the family, it's almost like being the family doctor sometimes, you know, especially an Italian family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get like calls about like how to cook certain things, but I would like to sort of, you know, metaphorically take that torch and, uh, and keep that sort of idea or something like that alive within the family as well, you know? Pass it on to your kids. Right, exactly. When the time my comes. Kids, kids, nephews, nieces, like whoever is, yeah, you know. Whomever. Whoever is, whoever is in the lineage, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, you mentioned going out. Where did you guys go when you went out for dinner? So, uh, you know, Long Island Italian family, we almost primarily went to Italian places. Oh, you did? It was, it was just, you know, it was yeah, still yeah. Italian places that we went to. We, we, yeah, we yeah. couldn't get enough of Italian food. And then it wasn't that it was like Japanese or Chinese restaurants, which I feel like is either a Long Island culture thing or it's like an Italian family thing. You either like go to town on Italian food or you're going to like, you know, a Japanese or Chinese restaurant. Mm-hmm. I-, I think it's just because you have like this overlap with like, you know, noodles and, uh, you know, carbs and things of that nature, mm-hmm. you know, despite them having polarizingly different uh, flavor profiles. Well, interestingly, as we mentioned, it just sort of comes to my mind that uh, what didn't pasta come from Asia? That, yeah. Originally? It, it dates back. There's, there's, there's reports that it came from Asia, you know? Um, and I mean, really like I'm, I'm the kind of like chef that says some pretty uh, blasphemous things. Like I think in, in, in a conceptual way, dumplings and ravioli are the same. When you really yeah. think about it, yeah. it's a wrapper that's getting stuffed with something. The only difference is, is like, you know, we'll throw tomato sauce or other sorts of Italian, you know, based ingredients with it. And you'll throw ponzu or some other sauce with like, you know, pot stickers. Yeah, exactly. Do you do you cross that line as well when you're cooking for other people? Absolutely, my man. See, my my big thing is, you know, me being a young buck, uh, I like to make waves wherever I go as far as, sh- as, you know, culinarily speaking. And that to me is one of the things to do. It's, it's to make waves and to kind of branch out, pioneer, you know, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel, but to certainly try and uh, be an innovator as far as, you know, the culinary world goes. And I mean, at this point, let's be honest, that's how you stay relevant, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more as we move sure. along, but I, I don't want to exhaust the uh, early year part, the early part of your sure. life. Was, was there a sure. particular thing? I know, for instance, when I was growing up, there were particular leftovers that I loved. Sure, sure. Was there anything that you sought out in the refrigerator when you were a kid? Like when you came home from school, what did you look for? Or or what did you create for yourself, even though you weren't a chef at the time, obviously? Sure. I mean, as a kid, you know, I was still... I was still big into my junk food. Like I was a real pop tarts kind of guy, you know, uh, <laughs> right. I, I, you can't go wrong with those. Come on. That's like, right. I, I could, yeah. If if you, if I was left unchecked, I would have put back a whole box of pop tarts. No problem. Mm-hmm. You know, but, uh, 
anything else besides that, I mean, you know, my mom was also a big, like, you know, cook, like loved to bake like cookies and confections such as that. So I'd always like, you know, go into the kitchen and see if she had anything and like, so there's anything. Yeah. We did like anything that she made that she didn't tell me, or maybe like I knew that she made the night before, you know, um, I certainly had a sweet tooth as a kid, uh, that has since diluted, but I definitely was big on the sweets. Um, and as far as leftovers went, I, I gotta be honest with you, Chris, I, as a kid, I had this weird aversion to leftovers. Yeah, it was just like a mental thing. But like, again, you know, that's obviously since changed, but yeah, it's like, like I said to you, man, like growing up the way things went, you would have not at all been like, oh, this kid's going to become a chef. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Interesting. I, I mean, to a certain extent, I don't know if you know this, but I grew up in a restaurant. My dad owned a restaurant when I was growing up. So go. I was in, I was in the restaurant all the time, either eating right. there for the evening meal if my dad was on the evening shift. Or we were eating at home when my dad would be on the uh, on the morning shifts and home in the evening, and I, I found that my uh, predilections when it came to picking stuff up when I came home from school, for instance, would run the gamut between Ritz crackers and 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 melted butter and jelly <laughs> on the one hand, <laughs> and and sardines and onions. Oh, there you uh, go. The Greek side, you know. I, yeah, I, I, I was going to say, that's the real Mediterranean in you. <laughs> <laughs> very much so, very much so. And most of those habits I still have. Sure, sure. Which I don't mind, yeah. Now, are, are there any of the habits that you established when you were a kid that have carried over into your adult life? Popcorn is oh. something that will forever stay in my life. I, I just, I could eat that stuff in... Freaking like those big bags, like when I go to Publix or a supermarket, even today, yep. and I see those giant bags of that freaking bright yellow popcorn. Like the little kid in me is like, oh, <laughs> like it's literally the demons are speaking to me, and I'm just like, no, 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 I need to yep. focus. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, you can't. You you could certainly do worse for a snack because it's a very healthy popcorn, basically. I, I agree. Yeah. Uh, also depends on what you put on it as well. Well, that's the thing. You yeah. Insert the chef in me, and I, I have like a thousand and one ideas on what mm -hmm. I can do with the popcorn. Oh, yeah? Oh, tell us about uh, some of them. So, like, uh, you know, well, so for example, um, so growing up, I was in the Boy Scouts, and uh, one of our, so like the Girl Scouts have Girl Scout cookies, right? And not many people know this, but Boy Scouts have popcorn, or like there's, there was this sort of yearly thing, and I'm sure most troops across the country did this. If not, I'm sure someone will pop a comment or, you know, a statement in on this. But uh, we would get this catalog in our troop, in our, in, in our troops, like a whole catalog, paper catalog magazine. And it was basically, you know, it was a fundraising sort of thing for, for, your, for your local troop. And, you know, you'd go and I think like whoever sold the most popcorn got like certain tiers of prizes or whatever so they had all these crazy flavors they had like you know your standard run of the mill or they had like these giant tins like 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 the size of a snare drum a bucket you know, yeah with yeah and it was three different flavors it was like caramel cheddar chocolate covered you know or like salted cat yeah it was like you want to talk about innovators here, man. Someone mm -hmm. was really thinking about, someone was in my head and was like, so what if I took popcorn and made it even better? And I just sat there and I was like, continue. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, as far as like innovations go from there, like anytime I'm here at home, I've had a long day of dealing with clients. And let's say I didn't get to eat all day and it's like nine o'clock. And I usually like, I know I shouldn't snack late at night. Some days I cave. and the 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 late night snack that I'll allow myself on a weeknight would be like you know a bowl of popcorn and you know the sweet tooth psycho in me wants to like you know make a caramel throw a little bit of bourbon in there maybe some maybe some cinnamon and like Ooh. really turn it into like you know a sweet tooth inspired popcorn mm -hmm. the the practical side of me is like chris let's let's not break out a saute pan here okay but it's like let's just take our dry seasonings that we have 
and let's make like, you know, a Cajun seasoning, a barbecue seasoning, something with chili powder. I like to make something that has like a little bit of kick to it and like some herbs. Mm -hmm. And I'll like, you know, as soon as the popcorn comes off of the uh, the pot, I I immediately just douse it and toss it in that, add a little salt and there you go. Oh, sounds great. Sounds great. It is. I have a feeling that a few listeners are going to try this at nine o'clock at night or 10 o'clock at night at some point. (laughs) As you moved out of the house and started, say, college, how did things change? How did your culinary uh, appetites and uh, exposure change? Freshman year. uh, So I went to school in Connecticut. And obviously, that was about three hours or so away from my hometown of Massapequa. So once I got up there, Obviously, you know, first year moving away from home and then like experiencing college was its own was its own microcosm of just, you know, emotions and what have you. But there was one thing that I knew for certain, and it was that after the first semester at college, I was like, I need a job. I need to start paying for some of the, you know, college habits that I had. And I was like, all right, let's, you know, let's find a job, you know, on campus that we can do. And so freshman year, I had found a job. So UConn was such a big school. There's like 20,000 kids that went there and they are such a big school and they were in the middle of like nowhere. So they decided instead of constantly hiring like a catering department to do any sort of like luncheons or grad- graduation events or anything like that, they decided to make their own catering service under the, the school's mm-hmm. dining services department. So they had a whole separate kitchen, a whole separate set of, of chefs, vans, box trucks, like it was an operation. And it was cool because, you know, based on your college schedule, they would schedule in certain shifts, you know, around your school schedule. So, like, if you had, like, three hours in between classes or four hours, say, um, and they needed people to set up an event that was, like, the following morning in, like, a ballroom, that would be one of your shifts. Or if they needed a dishwasher at the catering kitchen, instead of hiring, like, dishwashers from, like, you know, some town miles away... They just have us kids like come in, you know, obviously there's a uniform, whatever we wear, but uh, we would like to, you know, we'd be the dishwasher for a couple hours there and then someone else would come relieve us. And it was a great system. And then on the weekends, if you needed like, you know, you wanted to like work some serious hours, they'd have you work the catered events as a student caterer. So what happened with that was that's important because A, that was the first like real kind of restauranty sort of job that I had or hospitality, if you will, really not even restaurant. But it taught me how to set a table, how to serve, and then not for nothing, the leftover food we'd have from the catering events was cooked by these chefs, and they were pretty. They were pretty good chefs. They, you know, it wasn't like the same stuff we were having, at, in, you know, in the dining hall. Yeah, it wasn't institutional. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, there was some serious thought that went into this because we'd also get some very cultural events too, you know, and they'd have to like make these very exotic menus, and we'd have some leftovers. So I actually got to try in some of this food and stuff was great. So it started like expanding my palate slowly. So that was freshman year. I still had that job when I was at school, but you still had the winter and the summer breaks, winter break being like a month, summer break being like four months. So when I would be on break, I was like, you know, I still needed a job. So one winter break, my sophomore year, I got a job at my at my town's local like uh, pub. And they basically shoved me in that kitchen as a prep cook, not as a dishwasher, but as a prep cook. They gave me a knife and an apron and they were like, you know, here's how, you know, cut this cheese this way, portion it that way. Awesome, let's do a different task. Mm-hmm. Slowly but surely, I was like layering my, you know, kitchen etiquette as, you know, my knife skills and then technique. also just kind of like technique, saying behind in the kitchen, you know. Um, just all of it, like, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of the, uh, a lot of what people say is like, when you work in a kitchen, it's like a year in a kitchen is like three years at any other job because you just are soaking in so much at once, even subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Bottom line, as I was working this job, I was learning so much, even though I was just a, you know, a measly prep cook and I was a college kid. So like, you know, I didn't know my ass from my elbows, I like to say. So at that point it was like, there wasn't really like a a passion coming in that was like, Oh, I want to become a chef. It was just more so like, cool, this is a new task for me. It's something new for me to kind of like, you know, uh, to chew on, you know, literally and figuratively. Yeah. I was going to say quite literally. Right. And what would happen is I, 
would go home after some of these shifts and I would like start just like experimenting with other recipes. Nothing crazy, mostly rudimentary stuff, you know, mac and cheeses, sandwiches, dips, stuff like that. And in the meantime, you were a music major? Yeah, I was a music major. So it was uh, going hand in hand. You know, when you really think about it, you had sort of like the more uh, slower pace, more softer side with music. And then like I had like kitchens, which were like more chaos, more, you know, it was more manual labor, but the same, you know, hemisphere of my brain was being used, Mm -hmm. you know? So I, I think that was really what drew me into it. And, you know, eventually, as we said, once I got out of school, I did music for a bit, but like food was still scratching at my brain. Like, 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 like a dog trying to get back into the house, you know, it was like the whole time I was like, Mm -hmm. I still want to do this. There's something about it that's still, you know, beckoning me. Yeah. So what was the catalyst for your turning, turning from music to, uh, to cooking? One particular month, my mom goes up to me and is like, Hey, you know, there's this culinary school in the city that, you know, seems pretty awesome. Like it's in, it's in downtown in the financial district. And it like, it was right across the street from the world trade center Memorial. And she says, you know, it's a beautiful school. It's not like, you know, college campus, like vast, like UConn was obviously this is the middle of Manhattan. Yeah. My, my, my son, my son went to FCI to the French coloring Institute before it, before it disappeared. Yeah. Right. Exactly. A little further uptown, but still downtown, that same kind of atmosphere. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Bottom line, we went in, we took a tour. Uh, it was supposed to be just, you know, just because, ooh, let's like see what, what the like. heck. Yeah. Why not? I ended up filling out an admissions form by the end of that tour. And uh, I started my program like a month and a half later. And it was an eight month, three night a week program, which was great because like I knew that there was Johnson and Wales and CIA that was in upstate New York. The problem was, was that those places were far away from New York city. And although I know that they are very reputable institutions, I was not ready to a go back to school for another two or four years, depending on how I was going to go about those programs. And on top of that, I, I liked that ice. So the, the school was called the Institute of Culinary Education ice, um, which was in the city. So if I wanted to get a job in the city and go to school, it was very possible. It wasn't, uh, I didn't have to just like solely go to school, then graduate, then try and find a job. Mm -hmm. I ended up finding a job at John George's Spice Market when it was open, like halfway through my schooling. And I would go to school for those, for like Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, work from Tuesday all the way up to uh, Sunday and, you know, I was burning the candle at both ends, but it was, you know, all in the name of me. Yeah, I was young. I was able to do it. I, I would nap for like an hour or two in the lobby on Sunday in between like my morning class and then head uptown to uh, the meatpacking district and start my night shift, mm-hmm. you know? So, so you graduated from culinary school and did you immediately start working in restaurants? Yeah, no, I had that job at Spice Market. Oh, I see. So it just carried over? Yeah, yeah. So I like you needed a so it was eight months and then you needed a two month apprenticeship, as it were. Yeah, exactly. Uh and then you'd have to get like those hours signed off for you to receive your diploma. And I was already working there. So that was like that was gonna be my internship. And then I just stayed there after that. They were like, Yeah, we'll take you full time. So that was how it started. And then that led to your stints in various kitchens in Manhattan? Well, what would happen is, so Spice Market, when I was there, like subsequently closed like two months after because the area in the meatpacking district where it was, so they started up shop in, I think it was 01 or 02, maybe 03. And what happened was during that era, Restaurants were moving into the meatpacking district because it was very cheap. Yep. And it was like this like new and upcoming area. And what happened was everyone was signing these 10-year leases. And me, with the luck that I have, I started working at some of these restaurants at the tail end of their leases. And when they went to go re-up the lease, their real estate value went up like 400%. And the landlord was asking for that much. Yeah, and- ridiculous amount of money. Ridiculous amount of money, and not all these restaurants could afford it. And what 
happened was subsequently a lot of these restaurants, if you go to the meatpacking districts, they're not there they're anymore. Not there I know anymore. Uh, we did a podcast with my three kids, all of whom have worked right. in restaurants from the time they were teenagers. And my son, as I said, went to FCI and my daughter, uh, Alexis, worked for a time in Manhattan and she was working in one or another of the same restaurant that uh, the John Dory, which I saw on your resume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She worked at the John Dory for a while. She worked at um, the Spotted Pig. Then she worked at the Breslin. Right. And then right. she worked at John Dory. There you go. Yeah. So your old haunts, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's fun. It's kind of funny, Chris, because like even when I find people who are in the industry that hail from New York, there, there have been times when we've played this, like, you know, let's dissect our background game. And we've definitely crossed paths at the same restaurants. If not at the same time, it was like when one of us was leaving, the other one was coming in, you know, like <laughs> right, the revolving right. door. So which of, which of the places in which you worked, and I, I saw there was a list of a number of them that you furnished me, uh, and I couldn't include them in all, of, you know, the, in the intro, there were too many, but uh, which of those restaurants were most influential? As far as so, your your future view of what it was you wanted to do and where you wanted to go with food. So as far as what was the most influential for me, um, there was two. There were and and I luckily enough worked at both of these places uh back to back, if you will. Uh Golda, which was the Israeli uh it's like a Israeli breakfast, lunch, now dinner cafe that's still open, thank goodness, in Bed Stuy in Brooklyn. I helped open that was one of the sous chefs there and the head chef there, Ryan white was just this like West coast, California kid. And he knew like everything there was to know about, uh, like Israeli, Lebanese, uh, Palestinian, like, like that area of the middle East. Yeah. Otto Lenghi, Otto Lenghi kind of. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That, like that, that book, sort of that, cuisine. That, that, that that book is sitting on my shelf right now in Jerusalem. Yeah. yeah, those of you who are listeners uh, who are interested in Middle Eastern food, there's a series of books called Otto Lenghi yep. based on, not based on, written by, uh, I believe the guy who wrote them or or collaborated on them, is that's his name. Otto and Lenghi, yeah. Had, yeah, has had a number of restaurants in the, in the Middle East, particularly in Israel, and they're wonderful cookbooks. Yeah, a lot of people who are modeling like their Middle Eastern, like, Lebanese Israeli menus it's a lot of rehashes of those recipes yeah and they're and they're fantastic I mean we were that place the big reason why that place was influential a because it was the first time I was doing that food which was a totally different cooking style from my usual French Asian background that I was always like doubling back and forth between so it was already like breaking new ground for me on a culinary scale and it was my first sous chef job so I was given some respon more responsibilities and it was my first restaurant opener. There were so many firsts that were happening at that mm -hmm. restaurant. It was insane. Yeah. And basically, the chef, Ryan, the head chef, was just like the same sort of goofy, whimsical person that I am. Like, you know, very professional, but he had this very, like, fun approach to that food. And we were basically kind of fusing that food with American fare. And at the time, the place didn't have its liquor license, or, nor were we doing dinner service. It was just breakfast and lunch. So it was like a Brooklyn, you know, chic coffee cafe mm -hmm. that was putting out egg sandwiches with muhamora and beef bacon and, you know, sumac pickled onions. But then on the other half of the menu, we had like Michelin star style plated, you know, like large plates, like eggplant with saffron yogurt and or for, or for the beer you had like, you know, we had like a whole, a whole stuffed like squash with like a soft boiled egg, tahini, and like farro, and it's like a whole bunch of cool stuff. Yeah, it was it was a very beautiful menu that we did, and I really do miss that place. But to that end, I learned so much from that place. It was insanity because, A, I think it was a combination of me learning new cuisine from this awesome chef who I like completely clicked with. Mm -hmm. And it was also that it was my first sous chef job. So I, went, I made the jump from being like a foot soldier line cook to being like a self- a, a self decision making, you know, manager at that yeah, point. Yeah, and and you know, to to the TLDR, as I like to say, it's basically like Ryan went on a vacation that he had planned months in advance, and what happened was, you know, we had to let go of the other sous chef because he 
there were some issues. I, I won't say much of, but bottom line, he had to get let go. But, but like like any workplace, there are obviously there are conflicts at times, and they have to be resolved one way or right. the other. Yeah, correct, correct. So he had to get let go, and then we hired like five new cooks, and then Ryan had to go on his vacation because it was really like the only one that he had in like such a long time. So. It was like, uh, it was a bittersweet sort of like, hey, I'm going on vacation, but I know that you're about to be in a very rough spot. He's like, here's the inventory sheet and order sheet. You know, give me a call if you need anything, but I'll be in Thailand. So I'll be like 13 <laughs> hours ahead of you. So like I had to call him like either when I first got in or like right when I left. And that and the problems always happened in between. Of course, of course. And, 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 and the owner did not trust me at the time. He barely knew me. And the guy just, you know, in general was very was very choosy with who he trusted. And I sadly was not on that list immediately, but I, for two weeks straight, I was running that place and I kept it running. And even he told me almost by the end of like week two, he was like, I don't know how the hell you did it, but you kept this place running. And the staff that we had hired, I was like the octopus chef, just like teaching mm-hmm. them everything, you know, getting my hands and eyes on all the stuff that well, was going on. That's how we learn in life. Exactly. It was the stress. It was, it was, it was stressful, but yep. I'll tell you right now, I came out as a badass after that. And it was only uphill after that. Oh, fabulous. I understood. I was like, oh, so this is like the sort of stuff that I need to like get myself essentially submerged in, in right. order for me to grow as a chef. Right. You know, it right. was, it was that aha moment. Lead me through then the transition from working for other people to deciding you wanted to go out on your own. What 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 motivated that? Sure. So fast forward, obviously, I have a few other restaurants that I worked in after Golda, and what happened was COVID had hit in the city. Ah. And, you know, uh, it's, you know the story is, is old. It's, we've all heard the story, you know, COVID hits, everything shuts down, especially in the restaurant industry. A lot of us lost our jobs. We got furloughed and we're on unemployment, but the reality was, you know, it's, it's, it's a Band-Aid on something that needed like a surgical treatment, you know? We didn't know what was going to happen uh, for the, in the future. So what happened was my lease was close to being up in New York, and I kind of made a decision to move down to Florida. Yeah. And uh, I had moved my middle brother down to Florida like a week before everything got shut down in New York. And then when I went back to work, it was like three days later, and the governor shut everything down. And then the whole time that like you know quarantine was happening, I was talking with my brother, and he was telling me like, "Hey, listen, like you know it's cheaper living down here. Things are still open." You, know, you should consider moving down here. And basically, I, I made the decision. I, I went down here for two weeks to look for apartments, found a place in West Palm that was very affordable and had all sorts of cool amenities. And the area was perfect for someone who wanted to eventually be a private chef. Because Palm Beach County is one of the most expensive zip codes. And if you go down to Palm Beach Island, you can already tell there is a lot of money down here. Mm-hmm. So so where? how long have you been there? March will be two years. Ah, well, I haven't really been here that long. And you're primarily doing private chef work as well as catering? Yes, yes. How did Next Level Chef happen? So that is a funny story because, you know, as a, as a private chef, you know, I turned my Instagram into a finally like a business page. And in addition to that, I had people require like a, they had to send me a message request in order for me to accept their direct messages. And what happened was one day, March of last year, I was going through like the the requests. It was like like forty of them, and like spam mail. I decided to like start cleaning them out. And there's one that came across, which was I, like some intern from one of the casting agencies, and was like, "Hi, Chris. My name is so and so. I'm casting for a competitive cooking show that I think you'd be perfect for. Give me a call on this number when you can." That message I saw March was timestamped for January, so I was two months late. Oi. Yeah, exactly. So I messaged her and I said, hey, sorry, just saw this. If the opportunity has passed, I understand. But I'd like to stay in touch in case, you know, you need me for anything else. And she's like, the opportunity is still in play. Please give me a call. And uh, that was for another show called America's Test Kitchen Next Generation. I was going back and forth between the casting agent for that. Didn't hear from her. Sent a message to follow up. Got a message from another casting agent in the same agency and that was for next level chef they decided because i guess of my background as a professional they were like he wouldn't really do good for this show we want him on a more high adrenaline Mm -hmm. competitive show they could just tell by my personality i was i was more of a fit for that you know and so 
before I knew it, it was like four to six months of going back and forth between the casting agency and the studio, and they greenlit me and sent me out to uh, shoot season two. You know. Oh, so this is the second season of that show. This is the second season of the show. Correct. All right. So, uh, without divulging anything that you can't divulge, sure. Can you describe just in sort of general terms what the atmosphere is like? Shooting those shows and and uh, because I know that there are a lot of people who are in the food business who have varying opinions about these cooking shows anyway, and I, I'm personally curious uh, as to as to what 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 it's like. As far as the shoots go, um, you know this is a big network. It's Fox, so they they have their their T's crossed and their I's dotted. So to that end, what I mean by that is you know. They had us sequestered in the hotel rooms. Um, each of us were in our own separate rooms. Yeah. And the shoot days were basically just get up, eat breakfast in the hotel, get to the studio, shoot for like 10 to 12 hours, go Whoa. back. That was it. You know? How many weeks? It was the whole entirety of the show took about, I believe, four and a half weeks. But every day. It was it was it was six day shoots. We had like one day off on Sunday, you know. Just mm -hmm. it wasn't just even just for us. It was like the entire production needed right. like one day off. Right. But they were look. It was rough days, and you know, I I I still am friends with all the contestants on the show. But you know, some of us it, some of us were more. Let's put it this way: some of us were a little bit more uh, not accustomed, but I suppose some of us took took the stress of that better than others. You know? Well, con considering, you know, the things that what you've described uh, from your working in restaurants in New York City and my my son basically went through very much the same thing that you did. Uh, being a line cook, never got to sous chef, but was a, you know, was a prep cook, a line cook. Uh, uh, the the pressures are tremendous. The stress is just sometimes overwhelming. And I think, honestly, because the whole th the whole premise with this show is you have professional chefs, social media chefs and home cooks. I'm a professional chef. I've worked in those stressful kitchens. I had chefs that would like throw plates, throw tools, scream, and I was very much used to it. And so like 10 to 12 hour shoot days, you know, did I get stressed and tired? Absolutely. But I didn't let the the, the right. exhaustion get to me. Right. I still got up at 530 every morning and was working out in my hotel room, like just to keep myself, you know, good. Yeah, here. yeah. Well, because that, you know, the, the body affects the mind, affects the body. Uh, it's all, all one organic all. system. Yeah, we tend to forget that sometimes. Well, Christopher, Christopher, thank you so much. This has been very, very interesting. It's been edifying. A lot of this information I, I wasn't privy to, uh, despite the fact that I grew up in a restaurant. It's a totally different world now. This was back in the 40s huh. and 50s when I was growing up. So I wanna thank you. Thank you for being here with us and uh, for joining me on Cooking by Heart. And I wish you all the luck in Next Level Chef. Thank you very much, Chris. It's all a right. pleasure being on here. Take care. You as well. And here's a bonus conversation with Christopher Spinoza after his appearance in the final episode of Next Level Chef. Here we are with uh, Christopher Spinoza. And uh, actually, we thought it might be interesting for our listeners and our viewers uh, if Christopher also talked a bit about what he couldn't talk about in the first, in the, uh, first uh, conversation that we had uh, when he was deeply in the middle of Next Level Chef and the competition. Uh, so, Christopher, I, we know now, and I, I uh, hopefully some of the viewers and the listeners know that you made it to the finals. Indeed. How did, did that happen? Yeah, I did. So, I mean, it was it was a long, long road just on the show itself. You know, um, from day one, walking in there, you know, it started out very much as everyone was getting to know each other, and we're all kind of, you know. Not everyone is super competitive, but I think a lot of us deep down were definitely sizing up each other when we first, you know, kind of interacted. Um, and so from day one, it was certainly a, uh, you know, here's what I'm going to showcase initially. And from then forward, obviously, to the subsequent challenges, everyone sort of, you know, grew, 
uh, you know, ran into problems that maybe they never knew about themselves that kind of surfaced during the competition, you know, Mm -hmm. something like that draws, you know, certain things out of people, both the good and the bad, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And certainly for myself included, I mean, for anyone who's watched uh, extensively the show since the first episode, I am certainly a firecracker of an individual. I mean, you know, when I'm in, when I'm kind of in the flow state, as they call it, uh, I am all over the place. I'm wacky. I'll sing like little song lyrics to myself just to kind of, you know, play with the stress a bit. <laughs> yep. And um, and I also, you know, to reiterate, I come from professional kitchens. So, it's right. Like you been, mentioned this in our, our original conversation where you talked about the fact that the stress wasn't necessarily something that was uh, a, a, a determining factor in your performance because you're used to it from working in high profile, high stress kitchens. Correct. I mean, it was uh, even the first few jobs that I had in those kitchens, you know, I had to kind of get out of my shell a bit. I was very, I was almost too humble and too reserved. You know, a lot of people like to see humble people in this sort of craft because they're certainly more approachable. However, um, to kind of have too much of that will certainly, uh, you become sort of a doormat. So I, so I, I learned kind of that lesson previously in my career and I brought that already into the show. But I think certainly for a lot of people who have certainly never worked in professional kitchens, but are still talented chefs, it was just for them to see that sort of side of me come out. Certainly was, uh, jarring for some, and certainly for production, they uh, they looked at that as you know it was great TV, of course. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Did, did you did you have the sense going in that this was something that you could use to your advantage? I mean, if not even like to my advantage, uh, I think it was just more so. It's just part of my personality now. You know, yeah, yeah. I, I'm I'm certainly one of those people who have like sort of molded my personality a bit to like my to my job to my career. Yeah. Um, and, you know, take take that whichever way you want to. But that's just the fact of the matter with me. And I think it certainly just benefited me more. I, I didn't really necessarily look at it as like, oh, this is definitely my edge over the competition. I think it was just another dynamic to me that people kind of had to, you know, deal with in their own way. So uh, sort of talk us through for those listeners and, and uh, viewers who didn't see the sort of final uh, determination of how the finalists were chosen. You you had a problem getting into the finals, right? Correct. So uh, to kind of generalize my progression through the competition, I mean, I was very, you know, up, up down, and down, left, right. There, there was you, you didn't know what version of me each day you were going to get. You weren't sure if it was going to be someone who was very calculated and like, you know, on the ball or if it was going to be someone who was, you know, kind of playing catch up the whole time. And so with that in mind, uh, I had a very unpredictable progression to the competition. And I started off as someone that was sort of the de facto antagonist on the show for sure. And oh, really? I think, I, I, in my opinion, as far as Reddit and Twitter were concerned, I had, oh, yeah. wide <laughs> of that. I had some, some people that certainly were not fond of me, Chris. Yeah. 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 And, uh, but it comes with my personality. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it wasn't all, uh, um, uh, sweetness and light, uh, behind the scenes. No. Well, behind the scenes, we were all friends for sure. But I think what happens is, you know, you got to remember, I mean, we had 10 to 12 hour shoot days, you know, this was over how many weeks over about four and a half weeks, give or take. And, uh, you know, obviously the more you went into the competition, the more, the more you progressed, you know, the more you went into the meat grinder, you know, each of those days. And so I think what happened was towards the end, it was like, we all certainly were friends. We're all certainly friends still, but in the midst of that, you know, process. Um, we certainly went from like, you know, hold hands, kumbaya. And then towards the end, it was very much, you know, we were all stressed out, you know, and, uh, the, the competition was certainly weighing on us in yeah, that yeah. sense, yeah. you know? So, so what happened, uh, leading up to the finals that got you into the finals, even though it may have looked for a moment, like you were not going to make it. I think what happened was, um, I certainly had my own, sort of emotional uh, challenges as I was going through it because, you know, for the longest time I was like a, uh, I was very much not even doubtful of my skills. I wouldn't even say that. I think it was, I was just such a critic to myself that I wouldn't even take the victories in, in like a positive light. It mm-hmm. would always be, well, yeah, you, you won, but like, here's what you did wrong. And, yeah. and call that, you know, the kind of like the, it's like a metaphor for most artists, I believe, and anyone who's really kind of into their craft and constantly, you know, changing things. But yep. 
I think to a point, Chris, it kind of got a little like almost self-destructive in a way instead mm. of self-constructive. And so I think what happened was, you know, one of the producers that I befriended very closely, he, uh, he kind of just gave me this little like pep talk. It was like, you know, listen, you deserve to be here, even though you may think that you're kind of, you know, getting by mm-hmm. for lack of a better phrase. And I think what happened was I sort of, I finally took his advice and just decided I was like, I'm going to just show up each day. We're going to do the very best that we are capable of doing. And, you know, whatever happens after all of that, you know, so be it. Yeah. And, and, certainly- and also, I would think to a certain extent, what you're saying is be yourself. Yeah. Don't you know, try to do something that you're not capable of doing. Don't try to be someone that you are not. I will say I am definitely the guy that will take the the risks for sure. I am very much a risk junkie, if anything. I mm-hmm. I love going after stuff that scares the crap out of me, mm-hmm. especially if it's something that I haven't done before. Right. And in this competition, with the context of kind of how the dynamic is, you could certainly understand that that's, you know, that could certainly be a advantageous mindset or sometimes, you know, might screw you over, but yeah, yeah. Day, you know? So I think what happened was I just kind of, I finally got out of my own head and I finally just decided, I was like, we're going to show up and we're going to challenge ourselves. But we are not going to stretch ourselves so much on a creative sense that we, you know, snap, if you will. For folks that are not familiar with the format of the show, as you get toward the end of the show and people are eliminated along the way, correct? Right. Then, uh, how how did your fate end up placing you in the final, even though it looked like you may not make it? I think what it was at the end of it was so you know the dish that I did was a uh, veal chop with gnocchi with gnocchi that I made on the fly. It was a parsley gnocchi, so I I made it like a green tint with like mm-hmm. a parsley puree, and then I served it with like a jus from the veal chop and. Uh, chanterelle mushrooms. And what happened was, I think what carried me through to the end there, Chris, was the fact that I made gnocchi in like 30 minutes, mm. as well as balance, as, as well as juggling other components. Right. And I think that sort of showcased more technical skill than perhaps maybe like the, you know, perfect execution that the other two contestants, in my opinion, had. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously the judges will always find something that you did wrong. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what mine, sh- what my plate at showcase was just like overall, like this guy showed more technical ability that he definitely, you know, should have a spot in this finale. Right. Right. You know, tell us about the, um, the persona of Gordon Ramsay, the public persona as, as opposed to the back behind the scenes persona. Sure. So as everyone knows, the public persona, he is the, you know, loudmouth Scotsman who is very, who can very much articulate uh, tearing someone a new one in a borderline poetic, but very archaic way. Mm It's certainly what has sold his personality to TV. But I think, uh, you know, I can't say much for younger Gordon Ramsay, but I can tell you today's Gordon Ramsay, you know, in his fifties, the man is six foot three, you know, he trains for triathlons. The man is definitely a presence in the kitchen, just in a physical sense. But, even in between the shots, I mean, the guy is like a wisecracking, like down to earth person, like any regular human being. He is not, you know, he's not Hell's Kitchen all the time. Right. He's not the the, the sort of prototypical abusive chef right. that a lot of people uh, uh, per- create in their minds as being sure. his dominant personality. And I can understand how that's, you know, stuck. I mean, people's TV personalities, whatever it is that they curate. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, they, they, yeah. they it becomes a part of their brand, if, yeah. if you will. You yeah, know? exactly. It's, it's what they would go to a network or any sort of TV to sell, yeah. selling that personality. And that right. personality of Gordon Ramsay's, I mean, I'll tell you this right now, Chris, the man knows how to turn that on when he wants to. I mean, it's like mm-hmm. a, it's a freaking light switch for him. But for mm-hmm. me, uh, you know, when I talked to the guy, when I did get like the few occurrences where I talked to him off camera, the, he was super down to earth. He wasn't... Mm-hmm. Uh, didn't have too much of that angry energy all the time. I think it just gets exhausting after a while. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think what happens is when the person, any television, particularly in television, when, you, when you're sitting in somebody's living room or in bedroom, whatever it is, when you become a, um, an iconic figure in some ways, there's a reason for that uh, 
the uh, iconic nature of their personality to, to come across the screen. And they have to bank on it over time. You know, it's something totally. that they have to, that they, they created, and it's the, <laughs> the, the devil they have to live with, uh, right. in a way. Yeah. yeah. Indeed. Indeed. So, so what, what does the future hold for Christopher Spinoza? Has the show, has the, the, your appearance on the show made a difference in terms of your career? Uh, I do have some high-profile clients that I'm dealing with now. That uh, the show certainly helped push me into their, um, you know, uh, their arms, if Plans you will. On their radar, yeah. yeah. On their radar, for sure. Um, I have a major league baseball player that I'm currently servicing, whom I, you know, occasionally every other week I go out to uh, their home city. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, cook for, cook for them for the six-day game, uh, you know, the six-day stretches they do for the home games. Mm-hmm. You know, in a sense, I'm really using this time currently, Chris to push all my social media content, to work on it, uh, and to even formulate a plan on, say, like the brand endorsement side. And I was just going to say, yeah. Right. It's a big piece of this puzzle, Chris. I mean, people, uh, you take myself as a, as a professional chef. I had an Instagram prior to the show, and that was it. I mean, I have a Facebook, too, but it was personal. I didn't mm-hmm. have TikTok. I didn't have a Twitter. And when I left the show... Obviously, because I made it very far, the producers went up to me and they're like, hey, listen, they're like, get your socials up before the show starts yeah. because it's going to pay some dividends for this you. This is going to happen. And, and you're, you know, you've made it really far. And even the people who are doing my interviews, they're like, you were such a key figure in like our storyboard just because, you know, but the way I am, the yeah. antics, you know, it's really. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of people, Chris, that messaged me, not just family and friends, but random random fans would, would mm-hmm. message me on 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 all my platforms like i watched this show because of you oh how uh, great but, do you think we'll see a christopher spinoza uh restaurant somewhere somewhere in your future not in the very near future I, i'll be honest with everyone i i just don't think now would be the time for me to open something and even mm-hmm. if i did say i found some sort of like you know venture cap firm or an angel investor like yeah. tomorrow i still wouldn't want to do it I still don't want to do it yet. You're enjoying what you're doing. I think what I'm going to do now is really work kind of the social media angle. I'm going to make more videos. I'm going to get in contact with more companies to get like right. partnerships and paid endorsements because, you know, I am a chef, but I'm also a businessman at the end of the day. A yeah, lot yeah. of people have told me, including production people, that I should really be on TV again because of just the way the personality carried itself. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I, I have to say, this. yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, I, it was light lifting for me on TV. I, I'm so comfortable in front of a camera. Uh, there was no tweaking or dialing up or back with my personality. It was just, yeah. it was B, B you B, know? B, <laughs> amen, amen. Well, yeah. on that note, Christopher, we're all wishing you the best, the best in the future. Uh, Christopher Spinoza, uh, thank you for joining us on Cooking by Heart with Chris Sarandon. And uh, I know we'll be hearing about you in the future. I, sh- I sure hope so, Chris. And thank you again for having me on. Oh, please. My really. pleasure.